Here we are today outside Saab's headquarters in Trollhattan, and I'm with the man who has been responsible for saving Saab. Victor Muller, tell me, a hundred days into the takeover, how do you now feel? How is the job going? Well, first of all, uh, it is indeed remarkable. Today is the 100th day, and it's the last day of the first 100-day plan that we made. Um, we can only say that we have achieved more than we had dreamt of achieving. Uh, we put production back up. We got worldwide financing in place with the GMAC for both dealers and uh, end users, something that had been gone for basically one and a half years. Um, we have launched the 9.5, which is the first new car coming out of our factory since the acquisition. Uh, we made a worldwide tour uh, talking to all of our dealers uh, and a lot of end users to instill confidence in them that this company is now here to stay. It's got a fully funded business plan. It's, it's good for five years. Uh, and, uh, and that's exactly what we wanted to convey. This company is now back and, and it's, it's going to be around for a long time. In many ways, the 9.5, the new 9.5 symbolizes the new company because 13 years and it wasn't replaced with GM. And, you know, looking from the outside, that was the major problem with Saab. It was starved of new product, not necessarily investment, but new product. Can you give us an example of what you're going to do with the product range to get back the customers? Right. Um, well, very clearly, um, this infrastructure here, this factory, has been um, kept up to state-of-the-art levels by uh, GM uh, like nowhere else. Uh, they spend so much money on this plant, and that is what we bought. Unfortunately, until January, there were 13-year-old 9.5s coming down the production line, old 9.5s. However, GM did understand very well that that couldn't last. And so basically as early as 2005, they set in motion this new program to give Saab back its, its Saabishness, its real Saab DNA. And the 9.5, which sad for them and good for us, now is coming down the production line, is the first result of that. And this car, as you have experienced yourself, is a true Saab in every detail. And um, that car is the first of a, a large lineup of new product, 9.5 now. Um, 9.4X, the crossover, the first Saab crossover ever, coming in April of next year. Then the 9.5 Sport Combi, the station wagon, middle of, July, middle of July next year. And then finally in 2012, we'll see an all new 9.3. So within two and a half years, less than two and a half years, the oldest car on the dealer showroom floor is this 9.5. And that's a situation that Saab has never seen in its entire 63 year history. And what will all of the new Saabs share? What will be the DNA? of Saab that will make people say, okay, I want a Saab rather than any other car out there in the market? Well, first of all, we're very fortunate that the Saab driver is the most loyal customer uh, any car company can wish for. It's a fact. They are the most loyal. So if we just give them a car which appeals to their perception of the brand, independent thinking, very Swedish clean design and aviation heritage, if you bring that into the product, and this car clearly has that, it's very a sportive, sportive car, a driver's car, but very responsible in terms of the environment. If you bring all these ingredients into the car, particularly with a pretty bold design like the new 95, and we're definitely going to take the, the Saab design once no one notch up uh, when we move forward, then we will see them flocking back to the showrooms because they didn't leave Saab because they wanted to. They left Saab because Saab, for whatever reason, uh, didn't make the product that they wanted, didn't have four-wheel drive uh, solutions that they needed, didn't make any crossovers, or just plainly lost the Saab DNA that appealed to them. That is all changing now. So we, we are in a very fortunate situation that Saab has 1.5 million people driving around in a Saab right now. If one in eight of them will buy a new Saab every year, this company is thriving. And, uh, and actually, there are four and a half million people that used to have a Saab at one moment in time. If just a few percent of those would flock back to Saab because the proposition that we currently have appeals to them, appeals to them we'll be in great shape. One other area that I think people would like to see from Saab is being innovative, coming out with new models. There, You've given an impressive list of cars that are coming, but uh, one car that I would seem to fit very well for Saab would be a small compact Saab, uh, a 9.2 for my mind. What can you tell us about that, the prospect of a car like that? Well, clearly it is on the top of my wish list. Um, in this fully funded business plan that I just mentioned, a Saab 92 or 92 as I call it, is not included. However, the wonderful thing about this perfect storm that raged across this industry and actually allowed a small player like Spiker to acquire a company like Saab, 
that industry is now completely changing. And one of the massive changes that you see is that every manufacturer, every boardroom of every manufacturer is now worried about one thing and one thing only. How can we bring the break-even point of our company down? And one of the most ideal ways and quickest fixes for bringing your break-even point down is by actually sharing your technology. And, and this technology sharing is starting to permeate the entire industry. Uh, look at what Mercedes just did with Renault, uh, a, a marriage that would have been inconceivable just a few years ago, but it's happening right now. That also means that Saab, for the purpose of this Saab 92, this teardrop-shaped, um, let's say, entry-level Saab, but extremely premium, which comes from where Saab started, basically. Saab claimed and owned the premium small car in the 1950s, uh, before BMW, Mercedes or Audi ever entered that segment. Um, that car can be based on a, a platform that we would have with, that we would share with another technology partner. And uh, definitely it could be GM, because we have long-term agreements with GM for, the, for that specific purpose, but it could also be another uh, potential uh, uh, OEM to work with. And, and the wonderful thing about where SAP is today is that we are independent. We make the decisions for what's best for Saab. And, and so the choice of that partner is going to be instrumental, I would say, for the future of this business. As you were saying, it is quite incredible that a small sports car maker, Spiker, who makes 50 cars a year, give or take one or two, mm -hmm. can now be in charge of Saab. What will you bring to Saab? You, you have the Saab organization, but what will you bring? What entrepreneurial things can, can you give to the brand? Well, first of all, it should be made very clear that Spiker is not going to run Saab. It would be very presumptuous to think that a company that makes 50 cars a year is going to tell a company that's been 63 years in business um, how to make 100,000 cars a year. Clearly that's not the case. Saab had and has excellent management headed by Jan Arke Johnson, the CEO. And, uh, and that's not going to change. I took up the role of chairman of the board, but that's about it, as close as we can get uh, and want to get to operational uh, involvement. What we bring to the table, clearly, is what Saab needs very much right now. It's being carved out after 20 years being part of a huge conglomerate. And actually, before that time, it was part of huge conglomerates like Scania. Um, so it's for the first time in a very long time that Saab stands on its own legs, to, so to speak. And that is a very entrepreneurial, challenging situation. Well, we know about that, and we can really help, uh, particularly in the area of forging new alliances, um, setting up the independent structures within Saab and that's happening right now. Currently the company is carving out 23 nations where the GM organization was selling Saabs throughout the world. All those activities are now brought back to the mothership and Saab is running that independently itself. So there's so much happening there where we can contribute. Another aspect where I do think that uh, Spiker will definitely um, bring something to the table for Saab is let's say how can we further premiumize the brand? Spiker cars are very highly positioned. They're positioned way, way north of the Ferraris. And uh, if they're known for one specific thing, is I think the attention to detail and the quality of their interiors and exteriors, the craftsmanship that goes into that. And this market segment in which Saab operates, particularly with the 9.5, is very demanding in that sense. And we think we have a lot to bring to the table in order to further enhance that product. So you could marry some of the attributes of Spiker, as you say, the interior qualities, to give Saab the upgrade that it needs to make sure that it is a real challenger in the premium. Because in recent years, it's dropped to the bottom end of premium. Is your aim to take it right back to the top of that section? Definitely. I think uh, not only that's where Saab belongs, but also it's very feasible. It's in sight. It doesn't take rocket scientists, right, uh, rocket scientists to figure that one out. And so that's where we're going to go. Saab is definitely going to go up, not down. There seems, and what I love about you, that there's a huge passion on that one there. When you sort of look now at the current situation of, of Saab, take me five years down the road and say where you'd like to see Saab and why you believe Saab is going to be a success. I think Saab will be a success because there is a clear demand in the marketplace for, an, for a smaller, more niche alternative to the establishment. The establishment being basically Audi, Mercedes, BMW. Um, who are all now way north of 100, 1 million cars a year. But at 100, 125,000 cars a year, uh, Saab would be a phenomenal alternative for those who just want something else, yet to want to have this absolute premium feeling and, and, and quality in, in the product. So 
I'm very, very confident that in five years from now, coming back to your question, SAP will be independent. SAP will have a product portfolio ranging from the SAP 92 to the 94X to the 95. Um, will be profitable and uh, will have carved out a niche for itself which would entail, I would, uh, I would think, producing some 200,000 cars, including the 92, and could live off of that for, for decades to come. Did the amount of feeling for Saab that came out during all of the tough times, you know, you expect car workers of a car company threatened with going out of business to be on the picket lines to be supporting. You don't expect, in many cases, thousands of owners coming out there. Was that something that gave you the feeling, yes, we have a brand here that people genuinely care about, and this is one of the great strengths of this brand? I, I couldn't agree more. That's definitely true. Um, when GM put Pontiac, Saturn or Hummer out of business, um, I haven't seen anybody driving up to Detroit and lifting a, a sign, save Hummer. But with Saab, it didn't only happen in Detroit, it happened in 60 places worldwide. Um, there is such a passion for this brand that um, its following was willing to go into the streets and make that their support for the company known. And it wasn't just the owners, it was the dealer body, it were the, the, the employees who have shown incredible strength in the past, let's say, 18 months prior to the acquisition, um, supporting their, their management and supporting the company. Jan Ake Johnson managed to keep his entire management team together in spite of the, the, the perils that they were exposed to. So I, I think this company stands for a lot of passion and they have now found a very passionate owner. In the UK as well, in many ways, it's a, a very good uh, example of the loyalty to Saab there. Um, you know, it's one of your best markets. Is the UK an area you see as being key to Saab succeeding in the future? Absolutely, no doubt about it. Two-thirds of Saab sales worldwide, worldwide stem from three markets, America, Sweden, UK. So if Saab does well in those three markets, basically the rest becomes more or less like, uh, not immaterial, but less important. And uh, currently, if I look at the order intake, which I get every morning, uh, we see a very gradual but consistent rising of orders from those three markets in particular. And that it gives me a lot of confidence that um, in the second 100 days, which will start tomorrow, we will see a further strengthening of the uh, order bank and uh, the way in which the new 95, you see them right here, has been received is more than encouraging. The order bank for that car is really piling up. Victor, we wish you every success with your company. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Thanks.